and we are live. Hi, uh, welcome to the Wellbeing Show. I am your host, Norm McDermott, and I am here this evening with Dr. Warren Larkin. How are you doing, Warren? I'm all right, Noel. How are you doing? I'm good. Are you a mate of the Larkins who wrote the poems? Um, Philip. Do you think? My uncle Philip. Ah. Uncle Philip, who did the did the rude poems. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did go to Hull University, and he, he was the librarian at Hull University. Was he? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But yeah, no, not... I remember doing them for A level actually. Mm. They're bloody good stuff he wrote. He, he did some good stuff, actually, yeah, but I said to say, I don't think he's a relation, um, but uh, there we are. Well, you never know. It might be somewhere along the line. Somewhere. Anyway, good to have you. I was going to call you Andrew Larkin. I don't know why I was going to call you Andrew Larkin, because that's not your name, but that's not I, have these, I have these things where sort of when we're live, and I'm just reminding you we're live in case you decide to go off. Oh, right, okay. Um, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well. And um, but I, as soon as we're live, I sort of suddenly get this anxiety, and my brain wants to do something stupid. It makes me regress to the teenager that I fundamentally. Oh no! Think. Yeah, well that's that's yeah. I won't tell you about my involuntary. Uh, <laughs> my voluntary. Uh, Let's not finish that sentence. Verbal thing. Um, no, 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 no. Drink rather than finish that sentence. Uh, anyway, okay. um, Warren Larkin, great to have you with us. Um, you are involved in the field, and I'm um, uh, absolutely sort of think is central to mental health, which is um, looking at uh, resilience and um, uh, adverse childhood experiences and how we grow from those experiences and how we avoid them if possible, but you, know, yeah. you can't, it happens. Um, and currently um, you've got together with a group of extraordinary organizations. You've brought together a whole bunch of organizations I want to talk about mm. um, to talk about the resilience, what you're calling the resilience task force. Um, which is, I, I saw it um, on the news, it was on, uh, I read it on, um, what was it? I forget which newspaper it was. I just read it and I went, this is genius. Telegraph. Yeah, it was a telegraph. Yeah. Telegraph, that's right. And I just thought, mm. this is genius. What an absolute strategy. So just to say, as I understand it, and I'm going to bring you in to talk about it, oh. so people who are listening. Uh, um, as I understand it, it's about recognising that um, during uh, this time that we've gone through around the lockdown, we need to be serious and have a significant response to it from uh, a, a developmental and mental health perspective um, because this is uh, unprecedented in our times um, uh, this global scale of this and the fact that we've had to be locked down um, we know from previous pandemics that certain things are likely to happen so we have lots of useful information and you've stepped in um, with a whole bunch of colleagues and are um, sort of lobbying the government um, to think about um, the experiences that we are still going through in a particular way which I think is a wholly sensible way of looking at things um, and it's a non-pathologizing way it's a way that looks at um, how um, uh, everything that we know about resilience and adverse experiences. So um, I'm not going to hog that. I just want to come back to you and say, tell me who had that brilliant idea? Was it you? Uh, how did you come up with this brilliant idea? And then we'll get into the background of your work, if that's all right. Okay. Well, yeah. So the, the true story of this is kind of not as exciting as it sounds, but um, I'll try and make it sound exciting. <laughs> So I sat in the garden. So at the beginning of this whole lockdown thing, we had some good weather, didn't we? Which was quite nice. Yeah. Um, and then it went a bit rubbish and then it's picked up a bit. But I was sat in the garden and I was having a break between video meetings, as you do. Um, and I'd just been reading report after report about the harms that were becoming evident in society. So I was reading about the upsurge in domestic abuse. Yeah. I was reading about... Um, the upsurging family violence, so domestic abuse, child maltreatment, and, and cruelty to animals. Um, I was reading about the increase in alcohol and drug use. Yeah. I was reading about, you know, the increase in people ringing up helplines saying that they're, they're troubled with their mental health and that they're in distress, and children calling Childline, you know, for counselling and stuff. And then I was thinking, well, we've got all these, all these normal way, the usual ways of us kind of. Um, buffering the impact of that you know some of those some of those things those things happen anyway but in this period of restricted movement they're concentrated they're amplified 
People yeah. don't have those usual sources of support and people don't have the opportunity to escape those, those harms and those abusive situations. So it amplifies everything. And then I was reading about the kind of impact on um, the workforce. You know, people are dealing with this illness, this virus on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So the health and social care workforce. Yeah, absolutely. And people Which can include um, posties and delivery people. Um, um, or you've seen them in slightly separated off. At the time, I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking more about healthcare workers who were dealing with putting themselves at risk and their families at risk because they're dealing face to face with, yeah. you know, caring for the sick people, watching them die. You know, all these horrible scenarios where there is no good outcome, but they have they have to do it day after day. You know, um, so I was thinking also about the terrible pressure and, you know, risks that they're putting themselves under, both kind of in terms of getting the virus, but also in terms of. Um, the kind of burnout, compassion fatigue, moral injury that, you know, that they can suffer. Hmm. And then I was thinking, well, hold on a minute. This is as if that wasn't bad enough. We've probably got, or we, we're almost certainly heading into one of the most serious economic downturns for, you know, a decade or more. Um, and usually when you get an economic downturn, you get an increase in yeah. suicide, depression, anxiety mm -hmm. demand on services goes up resources available to meet people's needs goes down and then we're also potentially going to see a, a continuation of the workforce deficit that we've seen for the past decade in the nhs mm -hmm. um you know in 20, 2019 um a survey by the nuffield trust i'm sure someone will correct me if i'm wrong but i think they said that 94,000 vacancies uh, were in were available in the NHS at that time, um, so about forty thousand of those were nurses. I was going to say they weren't ninety five thousand cleaners. They were they, they were clinical. You know, forty thousand those were nurses. Uh, Twenty thousand were clinical admin yeah. people who need uh, help, help, who need to help us to do the job. You know, really important part of the team. Yeah. Um, shortage in certain professions like child psychiatry, clinical psychologists, mental health nurses in particular. Um, so, so all of those things together, so I'm sat in my garden, you know, trying to have a minute thinking I'll just sort of uh, breathe a little bit before my next meeting. And all of these pieces just came together. Um, and I just thought, well, this is potentially a bigger crisis than the physical health implications of this virus. And of course, of course, we're seeing a huge physical health response. Mm. And that's absolutely necessary and, and you know, fundamentally important. Um, but what happens next, you know, what happens next for all of those social and psychological factors that we've just described? And they're going to come together and they're going to, and we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, all those statistics that I mentioned and all those reports of increasing harm and increasing distress. Um, they're the tip of the iceberg because people who are being affected are still not able to get in front of professionals. You know, they're not having the opportunities to disclose or to ask for help. Or for people to see them, for professionals to see them, and go, you know, there's some there's some risk existing here. So that was the that was the kind of uh, the origins of this call to the government for for them to set up a, a resilience task force. Yeah. And you got an amazing number of organisations and people involved. Tell us how you did that. I mean, it's sort of I I, I think I can imagine why, but it's self evidently well, uh, a sensible idea. Well, I'd been, I was lucky enough to be part of the Children's Emotional Health and Wellbeing Task Force in 2015, which Norman Lamb convened, who was then the Minister for Care and Support. Um, so that was, a, that was essentially a cross-sector, very diverse group of people with expertise, including experts by experience, including families, including youth organisations, charities, yeah. you know, public organisations, all got together and produced this report and it, it, you know the key thing is we had permission from the government and from the minister to say revision what emotional health and well-being looks like for children and young people and families you know that, and, and we'll commit to making some of those suge suggestions and recommendations happen so we had a mandate we had there was funding attached to it and i was a part of that experience and then i saw how those reforms actually translated into changes and improvements in my local area afterwards yeah so that was my that was the model in my mind, and I thought, well, it's one of the few times in 25 years in the NHS that I've seen 
policy lead to real you yeah. know real change and, and the tackling of some complex issues at a local level yeah, yeah. so i thought well I'll tell you what i'll contact norman and see what he thinks about this whole thing um and norman was very supportive um he, he thought it was a great idea and he said okay well why don't you put all your thoughts down in a letter we'll have a look at it i'll tell you what i think i'll be honest with you about you know whether i think it makes any sense and um so i did that i, I sat down after we'd been on the phone i wrote the letter sent it to him um we knocked it back and forth a few times and and that and that's kind of how it happened really we just decided that something needed to be done there wasn't a plan there was no evidence of a plan and that we needed to they, you know, they can't, no there isn't a plan there, there clearly um, is because we're all caught on the hoof with this one i mean he caught us all out i mean there's no doubt about it and um you know even the i think it's it's clear now even the sage planning for pandemics were based upon a different virus not on the one that we got yeah i mean that's i think that's very true and and it was to some extent a surprise however i think you look back you know you look back to 2015 and you see bill gates's talk on youtube yeah, and you say yeah. you know the biggest threat to society is not terrorism it's actually a virus a pandemic um yeah. and also we know from the evidence of previous pandemics and previous natural disasters that you always see an upsurge in, in social and psychological harms so we couldn't predict when it would happen but i guess we could probably predict that at some point it would happen yeah. And I so, think one of the realities is that the resilience within our um, structures in society um, was um, had been degraded anyway through many years of yeah. um, lack of funding and lack of investment. So there were resilience issues um, uh, structurally, I think, anyway, society. Oh, definitely. Um, and also, I think in the UK in particular, we'd also come through, we were still in, uh, at the tail end of one of the most divisive political periods of time that I remember since the miners' strike. Um, yeah. And I remember the miners' strike. It was a hugely divisive, whichever yeah. side you were on. Um, yeah. And, and it, it ripped people apart, it ripped families apart. And the whole Brexit yeah. thing had done something very similar, I think, in many ways. So, yeah. um, you know, the, the social contract in society was somehow damaged, I think, during that period. And I'm not taking a position on which way we should have gone or not. I've got my own view, but I'm yeah. just thinking psychologically, I think it caused a lot of damage. So I think the UK was in, in its own way uniquely set up um, to be um, struggle uh, with, with something like this for many, many structural things. Uh, before we get into what resilience is and why you're suggesting resilience task force, I sort of know why you are, but I want to uh, make that explicit. Um, and I want to just come back to a term that you used, which was moral injury, which I, I'm not sure everybody will get. Uh, you took about moral injury on the front line for health uh, and social care staff, mostly for health staff, because I think the moral injury is about the decisions around who gets um, services, who lives or dies. And I, I don't know that was happening so much in the care homes. But so tell us what moral injury means. Well, I'm not an expert on the, on the subject, but um, it's... To, I can't remember the, the guy you coined the term, a, um, a professor from the UK, but yeah. it's basically describing that kind of um, impossible tension between one decision and another, you know, when there is no good outcome. Yeah. You know, where you're allocating resources between patients and ultimately the decision you make means one of them suffers or dies. Um, or you're in a situation where you have to make the least worst decision. Yeah. You know, but con no, whichever one you make, someone's going to kind of be disadvantaged because of it. And um, it goes against your fundamental belief system. So completely, yeah. All medics have this yeah. idea of do no harm, but actually they were being asked to do harm in very unsubtle ways. It's impossible. You know, you, you. I think the system forces people into impossible decisions and impossible choices uh, where they have to weigh up the relative merits of someone you know like with the whole thing about you know before the before the pandemic got into full sway there was this whole thing about how will they assess who goes into intensive care or not you know based on what criteria you know that's got to be terribly stressful for people yeah. working in that field deciding between an elderly person here with their family you know worried about them and a younger person who's got more chance of survival you know it, I know, I'm, I know I'm sort of characterising it in a very stark way, and it's probably much more nuanced than that, but... Yeah, but I mean, I think it needs to be, just to make the point, I think, 
Um, that, um, we've we've asked people to do something we've never asked them to do before. Yeah. In that way, I mean, there are clinical decisions that get made, Baines, um, um, giving life saving treatment or not, but they're clinical decisions. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and something qualitatively different happened for healthcare staff during this pan pandemic, I think. Yeah, and I think you also had lots of people, you know, who were newly qualified or about yeah. to qualify, nurses and doctors who were think, drafted yeah. in yeah. and put into situations that even people who've been in the job for many years would find difficult. And that's what an introduction to the world of healthcare that, that is, you know. Um, and then you had all these, these retired medics and nurses coming back into healthcare actually yeah. a lot of them quite elderly who were most at risk coming back into the into the fore you know which is when you think about it it's kind of it's quite a big ask really um and, and quite a number of those healthcare workers as well weren't going home because they're worried about transmitting yeah exactly and, and also and th this was happening as well some of them weren't going home because they're worried about the reactions of their neighbors and although we had the clap every Thursday yeah there were recorded incidents of um, healthcare workers being targeted for a number of reasons one of them being fear about transmission and that did happen and that's a well-known phenomenon in previous pandemics um, uh, that it becomes highly risky and there have been examples in Paris for example of um, nurses being driven out of their apartments by, um, by yeah. I know it is it yeah. happens and it's and it, it meant that some healthcare workers, some people in the NHS didn't go home for three months mm. and are only just starting to go home. And again, that feeds into this whole notion of what resilience is and why we may need to think about it now. I know you get the point I'm making. So yeah. let, let's talk about what resilience is and why it's an important concept and where it comes from. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's one of those subjects that, you know, there are books and books written about it and uh, everyone's got an opinion. So um, and there are lots well, of definitions. Sure, yeah. Let's give us yours. Well, I'll give you my view of the world. Yeah, um, so I think, so the old, I think the old, old potentially the kind of older perspective is that it's about toughness and grit and, you know, um, all of those things. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, that's awesome. lip and all of that. And, yeah, yeah. and I, I, don't, I don't buy into that at all. I think resilience is about adapting. You know, resilience is about being adaptable. It's about bouncing back from adversity and stress. It's about modifying your ways of coping in the face of difficulty and challenge. It's about how you ask for help. It's about how you rely on the people around you. It's about saying, I'm not okay, you know? And it's certainly not about pretending that you're, that you're a superhuman like a lot of us do in health and well-being, you know? Um, so I so think sometimes it, people use the image, don't they? The difference between a, an oak and some grass. Yeah. And a big yeah. wind comes along. Yeah. A really big storm comes along. The the, the grass goes like that. After yeah. the storm, it's fine. But you might find that the oak is either has snapped or branches of. Absolutely, that's a great. Damage. Yeah, great analogy. No, yeah, I think it is about it is about adapting and bending and, and moving with circumstance and adapting right. to the circumstances. And I think the other thing is that it's something that's acquired. It's not something we're just born with. You know, I think obviously if you've had a good attachment relationship and you've had nurturing caregivers and an attuned primary caregiver, that's all great stuff. I'm going to come back a little bit because I, I think I, yeah. I want to delve into this erroneous notion that somehow resilience is acquired because you give somebody a hard time. So the old notion of uh, toughening somebody up yeah. What happens if you try and toughen up a child in that way? Will they be resilient or not? <laughs> well, I don't think so. Right. That's well, not there's right. evidence. I mean, it's not just your thought. Well, so. I don't know the evidence on whether, you know, whether, the, the, you know, parents who have a, you know, a disciplinary approach to children has, has an impact on their resilience down the line. I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, but I think what we know is that Resilience is, is spiritual, it's cultural, it's biological, it's psychological, it's social. It's a combination of all of those things, actually. Yeah. And anything that a parent does to a child that makes them feel less than okay, less than adequate, less than acceptable, um, not good enough, not tough enough, you know, all those things, none of those things are good for psychological well-being and actually it could be counterproductive. So, right. um, 
I think we just need to get our heads around the notion that resilience is, there are some common themes, but it's idiosyncratic as well. So the combination of things that make me resilient might be different to the ones that make you resilient. Yeah. And they'll change over time and they'll change in different circumstances. So some people might find the idea of doing a, a, you know, a video interview live on the, on the internet and on various social media channels, a terrifying experience. They might not, that might just destroy their ability to be resilient and to function. Yeah. Other people might find it a tremendous opportunity and a wonderful idea and exciting, you know. Um, circumstance, timing, scenario, context, you know, who you're with, all of those things affect your resilience. But there are some common themes um, and the research would suggest that the common themes are having had safe, stable adults in your life when you grow up. Yeah. Um, having supportive peers, feeling part of your community, yeah. feeling connected to a social network. Um, the flip side is also true, not being isolated. Um, having some financial security. Um, and what's the other one? The other one that seems to come up a lot is regular sports participation in childhood. That seems to be another one as well, which I didn't expect, but uh, yeah. it comes up a number of times. And I think that's probably about being a part of something and also having access to um, safe adults because usually organised sport for kids usually, you know, has some adult involvement, you know. So, um, yeah, so they're the themes. So it is idiosyncratic. It's different for everyone, but at the same time, there are some things that we can predict will be protective if they're present for people. And the final, the final thing I want to say about resilience is recently there's been some work in the US that's shown that like adversity has got a dose response relationship. So the more adversity you experience before the age of 18, the research suggests that at a population level, the worse your outcomes than tend to be at a population level. You know, yeah. Obviously, at an individual level, that varies massively according to what coping strategies you've got. But the same seems to be true for resilience for children. So the more positive child experiences you've got in a certain realm, in, in terms of those things we've just talked about, the more protected you seem to be against adult, adult mental health problems and social relationship problems later on. So that's the good news. You know, there's a, there's a, a balance here between how much adversity you've been through in childhood and how many positive resilience building experiences you've also had to offset it. So you could have and is there everything on the list. On, yeah, and it's a time scale on these things. So, for example, let's imagine a scenario in which a, a, a child has some adverse experiences and then they move into more positive experiences. Will that counteract that? Um, or would that be the same if you're in adulthood and you go from adverse experiences to positive resilience forming? Um, is there a cutoff point? Well, I... <laughs> I don't think we know that yet. I think right. we know there's there's certain developmental periods that are more crucial than others. You know, um, you know, first thousand days of life are pretty important. You know, um, brain develops two thirds of its size in that time, and all of those things like attachment and attunement and all of those learning to co, you know, learning to self soothe and turn down your autonomic nervous system via a caregiver. You know, co regulating with you. All those things are like really crucially important so there are there are periods of real importance and the, you know the second one's in adolescence of course but actually we also know about this idea of plasticity and that people yeah. adapt and can acquire coping and can acquire social competence and all of those things that help people cope so my view is there might be some windows of opportunity that we probably shouldn't mess up if we can at all help it but I've worked with people who've had adversity and trauma all, all different kinds of times throughout their life, and I'm sure you have, um, and have managed to acquire resilience at different times yeah. or draw on experiences from the past. So I don't think we know enough about it in terms of that timing of things. But what I would say is no matter what people have been through and whether they've had those, they've been lucky enough to have those factors that, that build resilience in their early life or not, doesn't mean that they can't acquire them as an adult, you know? It doesn't mean that... I mean, I, I've them. seen people turn corners at Absolutely. all, all the time. stages in their life and when they've yeah. given up on themselves and yeah. I think in their 80s do it and 90s, etc. Absolutely, so absolutely. That's, that's my experience anyway. I, yeah. I don't know how that translates into population levels. I mean, I suspect there are different stories going on, but I'm not working at population levels. So. Well, 
I think from looking at the Public Health Wales research, that they, they showed two things in their resilience study, that if you've had resilience assets in childhood, you're less likely to develop mental health problems as an adult. Yeah. Equally, if you've had some resilience assets in adult life, you're less likely to develop mental health problems uh, compared with somebody who's had the same amount of adversity but without those resilience assets. So it seems to be that if you've had them in the past, that's a good thing. But also, if you if you can acquire them in adult life, that's also it, a good thing. It's so that's a factor neurologically that makes sense, doesn't so it? So it's a very I think it's a very optimistic story. I think my my view is the whole thing with adversity and trauma is that it's not a deterministic thing. It's not a kind of just because the population research says if you have poor races at a population level, you'll see more people with poor outcomes. It doesn't mean that on an individual level, somebody with four adversities is not going to do well. Yeah. You know, I know people with 10 of them who, who are doing better than me, thanks. <laughs> They're doing all right. Well, my age uh, scores are appalling, I can tell you. I mean, I, I hit every single one of them apart from one. Um, that I don't get, but I get all of them. But here I am, you know. You I, seem I, to be all right, don't you? <laughs> yeah. I'm, on a good day, I'm okay. <laughs> today was good, so I'm okay today. It's fine. <laughs> With a bit but of sunshine I, and a bike ride, I'm fine. But I think that's it. I mean, that, that contributes to your, your coping and your resilience, you know. Um, and th that's the thing I want to get across about adversity, the story of adversity, is that it's not one-way traffic. Just because you've been through really difficult things doesn't mean that you can't turn that corner. You can't find healing you can't find a sense of you know release from all of those things that have happened yeah you know, i feel absolutely optimistic yeah, and i think it's really important that people this one laboring the point yeah, people yeah. hopefully watching the show either now or at some point in the future get this mm. um, that um the, the sooner you recognize you're struggling and the sooner you get help and do these things that we're suggesting yeah. the sooner you turn that corner um yeah. and actually your then your adverse experiences can be trans formed into positive material in and of themselves and can form positive growth without a doubt. Absolutely. And I think the, the, the start of all that is actually recognising that you've been through something and, and talking to somebody about it. So a lot of my, my work's been about how do we get professionals and services to routinely ask about adversity? Yeah. Now, for me, this seems like... I have this conversation about three times a day with different people, and it seems... Sometimes I just catch myself and go, this is a bit ridiculous. How come I've been talking about this for nearly 25 years? That, let me just say this, this again, that we ask people about the significant things that have happened in their lives, good and bad, when we do an assessment, when they're seeking our help. How ridiculous is that to, to say that we, we're still not doing that routinely as part of our yeah. approach to people who are, who are asking for help? It makes no sense. Um, but there are reasons why there's a reluctance to do that. There are reasons why professionals feel uncomfortable with that. Uh, and it, it's part of our desire to, to help and not to do any harm. You know, every time I talk to a group of professionals about it, the, the, I ask what are the reasons why we don't do this routine and why we don't ask people adversity sensitively. And the hands will go up. And it's always the same answers. All over the world, the same answers. Um, I'm not a therapist. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to upset somebody. Um, the kind of work. Yep, yeah, I don't want to make it worse. Can of worms every time, the can of worms. Um, there is no can of worms. People are already living with those experiences and memories. That's right. That's right. It's a surprise to us, but it's not to them. They're living with it every day. Yeah. Um, so a part of it is about giving professionals a chance to kind of talk about these concerns, these anxieties, and to, to kind of counter them with fact, really, that when you do ask people routinely about adversity as part of a, an assessment, when you've explained what it is and why you're doing it and you've normalised it a bit, people are quite happy to tell you if they're ready to. But we also know that if you don't ask people, they won't tell you. And I've worked with people in mental health services who've been in services for 20 years more sometimes, getting specialist help for over 20 years, getting... And nobody's asked them. No one's asked them. That's they've, right. had, they've had 20 years of antipsychotic <laughs> medication. It's, it's yeah. incredible. They've exactly. had 20 years of medication and ECT yeah. and all kinds of treatments that have not helped because those uh, things aren't going to do with trauma. Very intense, dense diagnoses um, about their grey matter and all this sort of stuff. And it, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's crazy. The, the person, but even, even outside of mental health services, I think it's also the, the story is true of GP surgeries where, you know, 80% of our contact with health services in the UK is our GP practice. And I think it's actually higher than 80%. But um, 
but even there, and actually every single, single time I talk to a GP about it, they know every single patient without having asked them who's had those adverse life experiences because yeah. they're the ones who turn up all the time with Absolutely. one illness after another, after another, after another, after another. And every single GP knows that they're not there because they're physically ill, that they're there because of their life. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they're not asking the questions about their life. I think when you talk to GPs about this, that, that, that I tend to find that there's a, a kind of, there's a couple of opinions that I tend to get. Yes. One is we're barely, we're barely coping anyway. So you're asking us to talk about people's emotional issues. Um, I'm not sure we've got time to do that given we're under such pressure already, which is kind of understandable. And then you, you get another response, which is absolutely, this is what we need to be doing because what we've done for the last 10 years for this person hasn't worked and what yeah. we've done for the last 20 years for their parent, their father hasn't worked That's either. Right. That's right. And for so, the several generations before as well. Yeah. Which says a lot really about there's a willingness and there's an understanding that there, there are social and environmental determinants of health. You know, that a lot of the, the way we live, the way we try and cope, the way we manage our stress, the way we are in our relationships and our environment yeah. affect our health. They know that, but the kind of the biomedical, you know, the tendency to focus more on the biomedical response because that's readily available. You know, if someone goes in feeling distressed, can't sleep, can't concentrate, you know, feeling really down, the odds are they're going to leave with antidepressants. Yeah. And one in six people in, in the UK are on antidepressants. With an upsurge of about 30% in prescribing during this lockdown as well. Has it been that much? Yeah, yeah. According to a recent survey of independent pharmacies, the prescribing's gone up. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think because there's, there's less availability of mental health, talking therapies, uh, you know, somatic therapies, trauma-focused therapies, it's not an equal choice. So as, if a GP is faced with someone in distress who's just not improving, they're going to want to try and offer them a, a treatment of some sort. And, you know, if the only one that's readily available is a prescription, that's yeah. what you're going to get. Yeah. And Which the is not is going to demand a service as well. I mean, they, that's so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think there are signs that things are moving in the direction they need to. So we've, we're seeing social prescribing and the increased use yeah. of social prescribing, for example, which is a brilliant advance. So I think Definitely. for people who don't know what social prescribing is, it's, it's essentially that because you, what you're talking about is there are maybe deficits in people's lives around the, the social aspect or the familial aspect or um, other relational aspects or work or etc. There are various things that make this person more prone to becoming ill. Um, and um, we can actually help quite significantly by um, uh, repairing some of those deficits in a very direct ways. Social prescribing allows us to do that. So it allows the doctor, the GP, um, to prescribe events and groups and activities to people, um, which evidence has shown will um, produce a much more resilient response in that. Ab way. Absolutely, yeah. And that's when, when we've done, we've worked with various organisations, training them to ask about adversity as part of their assessment. The vast majority of people don't then ask for 20 sessions of CBT or yeah. eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. You know, most people aren't ready or in a position to take advantage of those things. Some people do, of course, yeah. and that should be available for them, which, which isn't always. But actually, the vast majority of people want the person that they've disclosed to to say, thanks for sharing that with me. I believe what you've told me. That must have been really difficult for you to hold on to for so long. And you were really brave sharing that with me. Thank you. Um, is any of that stuff still happening to you? Because if it is, we need to protect you. Um, yeah. And if it's not, is it still affecting you? Are those things that happened to you then still affecting you now? Do you think they might be part of the reason why you're having these headaches? Or do you think they might be part of the reason why you're depressed or suffering from anxiety or using drugs? And very often people go, well, I've never thought about it really, but you know what? It kind of makes sense that because I started using drugs after this happened or I started to feel down around this time in my life. And suddenly people join the dots and then they realize that actually maybe it's understandable what they're going through. 
given what happened in the life. So suddenly this opportunity to make sense of things happens for both the, the, you know, the help seeking person and the professional. And that's, that's where an opportunity opens up to take a different angle. And the, the angle is very often, what do I need in my life to feel like I can cope better, which is the whole social prescribing and resilience building stuff or therapy. Uh, but also for some people, the opportunity to kind of look at what happened and make some sense of it. And very often that, that will be with the person that they've told. You know, they might say, yeah, I'll come back. To, can I talk to you about that next time we meet? Because I need some time to think about it. And so not, not everybody wants or needs therapy. But what most people do benefit from is the opportunity to be heard and validated and accepted given what they've just told you and and that act of unburdening of kind of disclosing really painful things to somebody and being listened to and, and trusted and feeling safe with it that's a massive that's a massive deal for people you know um survivors of abuse tell us that one of the worst things that they experience is trying to tell a professional and not being heard not being validated you know not having the chance to make sense of what's happened to them and, and being having a compassionate response yeah. And, and the, the opposite is true as well. It can be incredibly therapeutic. Yeah. Um, when, when Vincent Felitti, who was the author of the original ACES study, started introducing this process of routine inquiry into their health assessment, they found in the, years, in the year following giving people a chance to talk about adversity as part of their health assessment, that they saw a 35% reduction in visits to the GP in the following year. Yeah. And an 11% reduction in visits to the, to the A&E department in the following year. Uh, and he firmly believes that it's because people were given the chance to offload in a safe place to make sense of what happened to them and to feel accepted, you know, that it wasn't their fault. To do that thing about become more resilient, you know, and I think, I mean, I have a, a belief that um, resilience is something in us that somehow it has been placed within us as a capacity like many other capacities because uh, we've been around for so long and yeah. you know the, the human race has lived in far more troubling times and um, well I think the, the recent times have been very troubling but if I think about hunter-gatherer society it was much more risky yeah um, and yet as a species we've come through that yeah logically matured and grown through that so it says something about our programming that i think this is could be considered maybe an innate capacity within us that if we can tap into somehow it grows i i yeah i absolutely agree noel so you just said something i think is really important um which is in the past before we had access to brain scans and and psychopharmacology and blood chemistry and all these things that we rely on so much now what we had was people that we trusted and we sometimes call them healers or wise person or shamans or whatever you know whatever the society at the time talk you know described these people as but ultimately they were people we went to that we held in high esteem we went to them with our problems and our ancestors would go to this trusted person and ask, ask for help, ask for advice. Yeah. And based on the quality of that relationship between those two people, something would happen. That healer, that, that wise person, that elder, whatever they were, would inspire that individual based on their connection and their trust to get better. Yes. Now, that might be a ritual. It might be a chant. It might be advice. It might be herbs. It might be something what we call it today is placebo but ultimately what it was is the same thing it's inspiring someone's natural innate ability to recover to get better yes absolutely. to make a change absolutely. yeah and we've we've moved so far away with all this technology that we've got and all these processes that we've got from that human asset which is the relationship yes absolutely and a, a lot of i mean a lot of work is done around the notion of a therapeutic relationship but uh, again that becomes hyper specialized and one of the things i'm hearing you saying is that there is um a, there is a problem in the, the way our services are delivered maybe that we've become a specialized into silos a bit too much um and, yeah. and that we don't like to break out of them and people are going well that's not my job uh, but uh, but I guess we have to ask the question: Why isn't it your job? Yeah. Um, uh, you know, why should it not be your job? Because what we're talking about are 
uh, in, or dropping into all these healing relationships, yeah. what might be a fundal, fundamental common yeah. thread across them, which is what you, I mean, it used to be called bedside man area. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are lots of words for it. I remember when I trained, we did um, one of the most interesting courses I did when I trained as a therapist was um, uh, looking at um, cross-cultural uh, uh, ways and cross historical ways of doing it's an anthropo- it was the anthropology side of the and looking at the anthropology of medicine and healing and it was absolutely fascinating um looking at these things and we did look at shamans i don't consider myself a shaman or shamanistic healing it's not where i would go um, but there was something really interesting to learn about um, how people would engage in that type of healing and that type of understanding and one of the things that we were told a story and it's a true story about a guy who was both a psychologist and a witch doctor. And he practiced in uh, Latin America, in the country in Latin America. And he had two doors into his office. And on one door was written doctor, whoever, psychologist. And on the other door was written witch doctor, his witch doctor name. And he knew how to practice depending on which door the patient came in. It was the same person with yeah. the same skill. Yeah. And just meeting, and, and you know, he would deliver clinical psychology as a witch doctor he would also deliver being a witch doctor as a clinical psychologist and he didn't see any problem between those two things very integrated in his approach that's that's fantastic isn't it i mean yeah it's wonderful because you're actually just allowing someone to choose what frame of reference they want to have when they when when they come in but ultimately you know the medium of change is a relationship whichever way whichever door they come in they come in and it's about can you establish trust can you establish rapport do they hold you in enough esteem to take your your advice seriously? Um, do they make themselves vulnerable, you know, a little bit enough to expose what it is that's really going on? So whichever door you come into, it's kind of, I suppose it's a matter of style, isn't it? Rather than um, content necessarily, because I, I think ultimately it's the relationship. Yeah. It's like Irving Yolanda it's, it's the relationship that heals. Going on, and it goes back to a couple of words that you use, which are, I think, early childhood development, attachment and attunement. Yeah. Are these two, let's talk more about those and explain what they mean from your perspective a bit more, because they are such fundamental, they come right at the beginning of our social time. Yeah, yeah. So in utero, we are still social, it's odd, in utero, there's, we, we're born, what, tracking, rooting, suckling, clinging, uh, no, tracking, rooting, suckling, um, uh, there's one other, and then smiling, and I can't remember what the one I've forgotten is, but there's I another. I <laughs> But, but yeah, it'll come back. Uh, but the smiling one is interesting. That we practice smiling in utero. Now, why on earth would we smile in utero? There's nobody to receive the smile. It's a purely social activity. Well, the reason is that we are so fundamentally social one postpartum once we're born, um, and particularly uh, because human children are born far too early. They're not ready mm. uh, for this world, and they need so much practical care and nurturing. Otherwise, they don't survive. And they have this one skill, social skill, smiling. If you think about an infant smiling and what happens when an infant smiles and what happens with the adults around them, immediately it's like, oh, you beautiful thing, isn't it? What? Oh, my God, aren't you gorgeous? Do, 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 do. And the infant gets everything it needs from that one social activity, which is yeah. extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, Mother Nature is, I think, mind-blowing in, in sort of how um, it has honed it down to these really clear things. So talk to me about attachment and attunement and why that's important. Okay. Well, just before I do that, I just wanted to say, I think you're right, what you said before about relationships and that we've kind of, a lot. most of us sign up into caring professions because we want to help, we want to connect, we want to help people. I hope so. Yeah. But we end up, you know, if you think about it, I mean, look at some roles now, I won't single any out, but the opportunity to use your relationship to help people is, is becoming, you know, far, far less available than it used to be. I'll talk about a role. Okay. My, my psychiatrist mates are in despair of their profession mm. because they've been turned into prescription pads. Uh, and that's just not what they want to be doing. They're not interested in doing that. I've worked with genius psychiatrists, absolute geniuses. I'm really lucky in my professional experience. It's spanned a long time now. Uh, and I've worked alongside absolute giants, I think, you know, and uh, we, but now I, I just like, I don't recognize that profession anymore. 
Mm. I genuinely don't. Rec- I, I would wouldn't dream of going into it myself. So that is the profession I would name. But that I think it, it's you know the biological model is destroying it. I think. Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, but anyway, maybe we'll come back to you yeah. know the use of leverage of relationships in, in service systems later on. But um, so in terms of attunements and attachments, so in terms of attachment, I would say probably most people have heard of Bowlby and his his kind of model um, of attachment. And basically, what what we're saying is that when, as you've alluded to, when children are, come into the world, they're pre-programmed to form an attachment, a bond with a caregiver because it's their it, it, their survival depends upon it um and what's interesting is the quality of that attachment then determines how that child interprets the world how they feel about themselves others how secure their sense of you know place and person is in the world um and actually we know that people who've not had good attachment relationships in infancy struggle throughout life sometimes with social relationships, with anxiety, with mood issues, with um, controlling their emotions. All of those things stem from that, that fundamental need we've got to feel safe. And if you don't learn that sense of safety from another, you can go through life not feeling safe. You know, you can always have that sense of insecurity and uncertainty. So it's kind of a fundamental, you know, it's a fundamental, um, requirement that we're programmed for but the other interesting thing is with attachments it, it's kind of it's not just a one-off thing you know it happens in infancy or it doesn't happen at all um we see it in in teens and adolescents you know and increasingly i read a great book by um gordon newfield and gabo Mate recently about um parenting and about how we have to be more relevant to our children than their peer groups and how society's changed so that actually adolescents are now becoming far more reliant on, on the attachments to their peer groups than they are to the adults in their lives. Mm-hmm. And, it, and if you're going to choose a kind of mentor, role model, guide, counsellor, source of support and advice for, for, an ad, for an adolescent, you wouldn't pick another group of adolescents, would you? You'd pick, Not necessarily, no. <laughs> you'd pick an adult, a safe adult. Or, or a, a number of safe adults, um, and just the way we live is, you know, the way we live now means that those those scenarios are playing out more and more. And this book, you know, their book is basically saying, look, we need to find ways of staying connected and relevant to our adolescent children, yeah. because if we don't, there's an attachment void, and that that fundamental urge to feel connected and safe and, and feel important, not important, it's the wrong word, um, feel valued. That that need carries on throughout our lives, especially in adolescence, and we need to fill it. So if kids don't have that attachment relationship in adolescence, that's when we see children being exploited and groomed. That's when we see children joining gangs. That's when we see children getting involved in, you know, criminal exploitation, um, because there's an attachment void. There's something missing, and well, then they fundamentally. I can tell you, I mean, I did a lot of working gangs with um, kids on the streets in South London and stuff like that. And without a doubt, they all tell me exactly the same story. You know, why are you in the gang? I'm looking for love. That was it. Do you yeah, know, they were looking for attachment. I mean, they were absolutely explicit about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that was what was being manipulated by the gang leaders without a doubt. That they, they were stepping into that void where there were not um, safe adults in their life. And um, these gang leaders were the closest to a safe adult you were going to get. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they know and, that. Yeah. They know uh, that and they exploit, you know, in, in, you know, near where I live, there are some children's homes and we, you know, there's been a problem with people waiting outside these children's homes because they know there are vulnerable young people there. And they, you know, they hang around outside in a fancy car and say, you know, the, the trainers are not looking so good. Come on, jump in. I'll, I'll sort you out with some trainers. So just to, to nail it down so that people who are listening and some people, quite a lot of people who tune into the show are not uh, from a psychological professional background at all. So I just want to nail what attachment is. Attachment is a stable, loving relationship between a caregiver and a child. Yeah. And those roles are important. You know, that's why the role of parent to teenagers is still important because that's still happening. That attachment is absolutely. Happening. 
Yeah. The same thing is happening in schools because teachers are authority figures, adults in a caring role. And so attachment processes are opened up in school. And what these attachment processes do is that they, uh, they form certain neurological processes that are not available in other types of relationships. And fundamentally, these neurological processes are the core of personality building. Would that be fair to say? I think in infancy, that's definitely the case. You know, I think you, your brain uh, adapts to its environment. And in that, in that first thousand days of life, all that synaptic pruning happens and anything that's not hardwired, like a sense of internal safety, co-regulation, the ability to switch off your autonomic nervous system, calm your stress response. Yeah. We haven't learned that through a, a reliable adult, which is where attunement comes in. So if you've not had a caregiver that's attuned to your needs as an infant. So yeah. when you, you said, no, that, you know, the child smiles or, or gets upset or cries or whatever. If, if that, you know, what we would expect in a nurturing environment is that the caregiver would, would approach reliably. They'd say soothing things, they'd smile and the, the facial muscles here would contract and that would trigger off a response to the child, a soothing response. Then there'd be touch which releases oxytocin and all of those, you know, relaxing uh, chemicals. So there's a very powerful um, connection and kind of relational um, activity and, ritual happening. And mirror neuron production as well. So absolutely, if yeah. You've got the, the stable adult has a complex set of neurological processes, which can then mirror or, or produce sympathetic responses in the brain of the infant. Absolutely. And training the brain of yeah, yeah, making yeah. it grow in that direction. And, and we call that co-regulation. And, and yeah. it's something we're not born with. We have to learn to regulate our nervous system, to turn off our stress response. We have to learn it. And this is why attunement is so important. And we know now from, from various, you know, from probably 20 years of studies that if someone's not had an attuned caregiver, they struggle to self-regulate. They struggle to soothe themselves. And so you know, our sympathetic nervous system will yeah. develop because of the attunement. Absolutely. And that becomes hardwired during that synaptic pruning process. And if it's not been ingrained and hardwired, then people struggle with that. They struggle with emotion, managing emotion. They struggle with frustration. Let's explain these terms against people. You've got yeah, yeah. two nervous systems. Well, you've got more than two, but these two that we're talking about, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the one that um, produces the... Um, excitation yeah the stress response yeah yeah. so uh, but it also could be you know in the um a, 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 a stress response i think people just automatically think it's a negative thing like negative. a roller coaster is also like a, a stress yeah, yeah yeah we would call it excitement and fun excitatory yeah 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 so we're the it's the excitation response yeah yeah and the parasympathetic does the relaxation response stress, yeah and we need both of them to function healthily yes yeah. Otherwise, yeah. if we don't, and we were, we're, but we're born with the ex the ability for excitation, but not born with the ability for relaxation. Well, we need to learn how to use that. Yeah, we need to learn to put that break on on the stress response system. Um, yeah. And there's a whole lot of really interesting research now about the kind of the, you know polyvagal theory, Stephen Porges' work, and you know um, Besson van der Kolk talks about it, and. So there's a lot of fascinating stuff about that, but I think so the let's core... jump forward. So yeah. this is the adult then going into the GP. I'm not going to pick on GPs, but let's just say because because that's where most people's health contact is in the UK anyway. Um, so the um, uh, I'm going to give you a theoretical situation to see what you think about it. So um, the, there's somebody who's had um, def some deficits, not huge deficits, but some deficits in attachment and attunement uh, early on, and maybe um, uh, and then some later life adverse experiences. And, and they go in, um, they see the GP, and the GP is a generally quite stable person who has had pretty good resilience. Um, through life and the GP thinking about GP's fantasies about this or anybody's fantasies about this um, and then the, the, the that person the caregiver um, asks these questions about adversity from a stable position themselves and with their sort of stable neurological framework I'm guessing that what that does in the patient who has that deficit is that it encourages the resilience response 
because the mirror neurons, the attunement, the attachment forming in that moment with the patient is it then becomes good enough in the relationship with the caregiver. Is that would that be a, a correct assumption to say? It wouldn't be that simple, I know. Well, I think I think I'll probably put it a bit more simply than that. I think okay. I think what you're describing is the is the kind of neurological processes associated with people feeling safe. Yeah. Yeah. And and if two people who are dysregulated tend not to make each other feel safe. And, and what you're saying is if you had the GP it was pretty in tune and, and calm and you know um, fairly secure in themselves, they would be able to, in the face of someone who was stressed and upset and, and dysregulated, you know, mirror that regulatory process and co-regulate with them, help them calm that response. And ultimately, if the person feels safe enough with them, they'd be more likely to connect and trust and engage in that process we talked about earlier on, which is kind of transformation through relationships. You know, uh, they'd be more likely to talk to them about the bad things that have happened in their lives. And, and that's one of the problems with this pandemic situation is that a lot of those relational things that we do, those, those, um, that reciprocity, that connection, that, yeah, a lot of the stuff that's really important, like intonation and facial expression and proximity and body language, and all those things that make people feel safe, touch, you know, um, they're a bit lost, I think, in the world yeah. of video conferencing. I don't think it's quite the same. It's not impossible, but I think it's a lot harder for people. Well, I, I mean, I think videos do very different things because it's more on the dopamine excitation side of things. You know, you know as far as I know, mirror neurons are not activated in across the screen unless you know the person previously I don't know. it'd be interesting wouldn't it it's been interesting research I think, to do, I think that's it? true unless you know the person previously real world if it's just your meeting like between you and i at the moment as, as far as i understand it the mirror neurons between you and i are not activated but if we'd met each other real world i think then yeah yeah yeah, it yeah. Would be. Uh, and that sort of makes sense to me um and um but then it's it's also oxy oxytocin is produced less in the um, in the video world, it's not impossible, but it's more on the dopamine side of things. So, mm. And that's why people are feeling exhausted all the time. I was going to say, that's why people are knackered after the... That's after right, the they're getting all these bloody yeah. highs, do you know yeah. what I mean? And then just go, crash. like I've just had loads of sugar, you know. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think looking at, I think people looking at themselves on, on a video screen is unnatural as well. That's another thing that people find so, stressful. Going, do I look at, have I got a spot? There's <laughs> all that sort of going on. Um, but you can, with Zoom, you can actually turn self view off, which is um, a, a quite handy little thing. But um, I, I'm a bit more narcissist. I'm going to keep mine on. I actually quite <laughs> like my picture. There you go. Um, so, um, so that, I mean, I think that's really important. And I've sort of, I, I know I've, uh, maybe made a bit of a meal of it, but I think it is really important to get that point across because I think it's uh, it, it's it's crucial. There's a there's a thing like in when I was trained, when I was actually oh blimey, when dinosaurs still walk the earth. Um, he's talked a lot about transference and counter transference. These really complicated terms, which I just think should be shredded because they you know they're too complicated. But it is simply this stuff, isn't it? That um, you know, if you're pretty stable emotionally and psychologically and somebody comes in front of you who isn't, uh, if you stay stable with them, that has a profoundly therapeutic effect on them. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, I, I think it's, for me, I think it's about knowing what's your stuff and what's their stuff yeah. and being able to yeah. keep the two in mind whilst making sense of what's happening. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's one other thing I want to say about attunement, if it's all right, no, um, no which is that, you know, the late, some of the latest research says that people who've struggled with attunement have not learned to that self-regulation process, that parasympathetic yeah. nervous system down-regulating process. Of course, you know, will struggle, more likely to struggle with relationships and, and emotion and yeah. frustration, yeah. potentially anger, but also find other ways to self-soothe. And unfortunately, sometimes those ways are harmful you know so people who've who've not had the ability the, you know the the attuned relationship struggle with self-regulation struggle to feel calm struggle to turn off that stress response and and not surprisingly have a propensity to substance addiction or not even substances well food alcohol yeah. drugs smoking sex gambling pornography yeah. whatever it is there's a there's a kind of we all have to find a way to feel at ease and i think it's that 
that inability to to calm ourselves that is the problem um that you know the stress response being overactive and not feeling not feeling okay in your own skin kind of thing so that kind of makes sense it it does make sense and it's interesting that some of those peer-to-peer groups like um, alcoholics anonymous for example some of their um original literature they talk about fear being the core of the response of an alcoholic um which is essentially what you're talking about this inability to regulate yeah and yeah. dang regulate as it were yeah of, and just constantly being uh, active and anxious and unsettled and and, and then needing something to do that uh, and yeah. then the cure as aa would see it which is again something similar to that you're you're talking about is to join a group of people who are actively trying to go manage and co-regulate yeah connection and, safety yeah. belonging okay. all of those things that build resilience you know spirituality yeah yeah um i mean the other thing that that is interesting about that is um, those those groups are kind of um, I think when you look at it it's what is it what's the therapeutic ingredient in those groups you know what is it about those things that make people feel they can cope without alcohol or drugs you know um, I, I think potentially it's all the things we talked about earlier that build resilience you know yes. being a part of something yeah. feeling love feeling kindness feeling connection um yeah. feeling that you're on a journey that someone else has been been on before um yeah. it provides hope and it's in, you know it's role models it's all of those social factors isn't it that we try and provide as as therapists yeah. but done through a peer network which is incredible really yeah and I think in some ways it's more effective. It's, in some ways it's not. I mean, I think just simply because I'm just thinking about the whole thing about personality growth being crucial, as I would say, I, yeah. I want to hear from you, but for personality needs to change and grow um, if we truly want to become resilient. So something I will talk to my patients about is getting into a, a sort of psychological gym. And so one thing you want to do if you want to be healthy long term is to have not just a network of people around you, but you want a diverse network of people mm-hmm. around you. you want li- lots of different types of personalities and you want to include people you don't necessarily like because your brain is going to work harder. Your personality growth will be that much better for you and that will in- increase your resilience sort of in return of uh, But also it means that you have um, greater resilience in the real world. So if you, I think about it in terms of, uh, it's, it's funny what we do as humans, but I think about it in these terms. If you've got farm A and farm B, they've both got five fields, and farm A decides to farm only one crop in all five fields, and farm B has five different crops, a different crop in each field, a blight comes along that affects a crop, well, which one is more resilient? Which one is likely to survive? Well, farm B, obviously, you know, and and that's just a truism of life. If you talk to any business person, they'll tell you, of multiple income streams, you don't have one. You're going to diversify, yeah. That's right. But as human beings, yeah, yeah. we think to go, no, I only want one type of person in my life. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't really know how that comes about, to be honest. But it, well, it, I think I think we're, we're attracted to people that remind us of ourselves, aren't we, to some extent? Um, yeah, yeah. It is some um, little sense of narcissism going there. I thought I was having yeah, a flashback absolutely. to sort of um, whole level ask questions then, no, with the, with the two fields and you've got five yeah. crops here. Yeah. I was having a bit, a bit worried then. We're getting a bit anxious. Oh no! Yeah, it's exam at the end of I it. failed maths at school, so I, I yeah. never do maths above t- two hands. It's okay. You're safe. Yeah, yeah. It, once yeah. you get beyond counting on things, you're in trouble. Stop. Yeah, you're in trouble stop. after that. So you're safe. So you're safe. Uh, what I'm interested in is sort of one of the things I'm interested in. I'm just aware that we've we've gone on and the, the you know we're into the last sort of uh, bit of the show. To be honest, um, I told you it goes quick. It has gone quick, um, yeah. It does. I mean, it sort of, you know, um, when I have interesting people, it was just fascinating stuff. But I, I, if you well, they weren't like, available, like, no. Sorry? Those interesting people weren't available this evening, which is why I'm here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, classic, classic English humour. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Americans think we're mad when we say things like this. Yeah, no, what is it anyway? <laughs> I'm just selling over the liver. That's what we do in Britain, and oversell and under deliver. That's what they do in the US. So there you go. I've just started World War Three. Ah, no, I've um, set you up on a tangent. Sorry. It's all right. No, I don't mind. I can come back. Um, so I, I want to go off into not a tangent, but into a new direction, which is I'm intrigued um, as to um, sort of how you got into this field. 
uh, and what was the motivation motivate us to get into it because it's a it's a complex interesting field and um, um, although the answers are simple it's difficult to get people to do them because they seem too simple you know like um, uh, what do I do about my psychosis well you could join a group of people that are loving and like look after you and be kind to you oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you mean yeah you know uh, but anyway uh, sort of what motivated you to get into um uh, into this you're a doctor of psychology mm -hmm. um why on earth did you put yourself through that i mean what was... um well it was an accident really if i'm honest um yeah. so the, the honest answer is that i left school with um very few qualifications right and the pits had closed so you made reference to the miners, right? Yeah, the pits, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, my, my dad and my uncle Bill were both miners um, and the pits had shut. That wasn't an option. Um, I tried to get an apprenticeship, but because I hadn't passed maths and English, um, I, I wasn't getting anywhere. And the anxiety uh, when I brought my fingers off. Sorry? That's and the anxiety, anxiety yeah. yeah my my that, that's what set me off, yeah. Um, so I, you know... I think I had two O levels. Good example a, of an adverse childhood experience coming, coming back, back to me. Into Yeah, triggered straight away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I, I got like two O levels or something. Um, but for for the younger people watching, the O levels are the thing that get before <laughs> GCSEs. Um, when we used to write on slates and stuff uh, in the past, <laughs> when computers were the size of the room, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. So I, I came out of school with like two O levels. Uh, uh, what was it? Woodwork and religious studies. Brilliant. What a combination. Right. I mean, the world's your oyster, right, at that point. Well, my dad said to me, the only person who ever made that work was Jesus' dad. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, well, that job's taken, isn't it? Yeah. Um, or a victory makes coffins. That's the other thing you could probably do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But I wasn't in. So anyway, I, I figured... I didn't have many options really. So I decided I would go. I even failed an apprenticeship test to make garden tools uh, at a famous forge in Wigan. Uh, so I figured I'd better go and do my O levels again. So I went back to, I went to the six, local sixth form college. And my experience at school, I, I didn't enjoy it. Um, mm. Secondary school in particular, I, I kind of survived rather than thrived. Um, and came out of secondary school thinking that I wasn't particularly smart. And in fact, that's probably because my um, careers advisor in, in my final term said to me that I wasn't smart enough to do A-levels or a degree or anything like that. And I needed to get a job and work with my hands. Um, so I left with, with, with not many qualifications and not much confidence. And, I was um, going to say, I mean, you sort of yeah. esteem somewhere on the floor if not on the floor. Well, yeah, yeah, not great, not great. I mean, I, I, I joke with my wife, and when I turned 40, I said, I think I've spent the last, um, you know, 25 years recovering my sense of self-worth since I left school, you know, and I've just about managed it, I think, uh, when I got to the age of 40. But um, so I went on to, the, I went on to sixth form college to do, um, resit my maths and English, because I figured unless I got those, I'm, I'm screwed, really. Hmm. Um so I went there and I passed maths and English and I got to, the weird thing was I got into that environment and it was a completely different experience to the school that I went to. So the school that I went to was pretty poor, really. Um, academically, you know, socially, the, the opportunities that were available. It was a pretty, it was a pretty deprived area. So it was an adverse experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't a great experience. You know, it was, it was, not it's not a time that i remember with uh, much fondness if i can be be honest uh, and I, I think i left with more deficits than i gained from yeah, from that experience yeah. um so I went then, to, then you went to another school yeah so i went to sixth form and i walked in and it was like this is different like the teachers treat you respect and, and expect you to do well wow that's amazing you know um and they encourage you and you actually learn something in the class because there's some sense of order. It's not chaotic, you know, um, and it feels somehow safer and more stable and a bit more predictable. And in that environment, lo and behold, I found that I could learn. Exactly. Yeah. So it was like, oh my God. So actually I came out of school thinking I was stupid and actually in actual fact, I was just the product of 
a toxic environment. Yeah. I'm not saying I had no part to play in it, you know, but um, it's interesting that three months later in a different environment, I pass mastered English on a different curriculum within three months, which is like, what happened there? Suddenly I could learn. Suddenly I realized that I had some potential and the teacher said, all oh, right, why don't you do A-levels now you're here? And I was like, what do you mean? I, I, I'm not sure if I'm up to that. Oh no, you know, you'd be fine. You did really well with your O-levels. It, it'll be fine. I was like, well, I need to talk to my parents about this. This is not part of the plan, you know? Um, so I, I said, okay, I'll do A-levels. What, what have you got? So you were transplanted into what I would call a facilitating environment. Definitely. Yeah, right. definitely. Both and he's blossomed both, as a result. I blossomed, yeah, both in terms of the environment and, and its sense of safety and, uh, and predictability, uh, lack of sort of threat and chaos, teachers who had capacity to kind of teach and to nurture um, that were encouraging and treated you with respect. Um, and, you know, and in those days, you know, it was when teachers hit kids and used violence to get what they wanted, you know, and threat and intimidation, as opposed to encouragement, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, connection and trust and all of those things. So it was a bit, it was a bit of a different thing. Um, and so but, that, that second set of teachers showed attachment, attunement, et cetera, those types yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. And good parenting in terms of predictability. You knew if you did X, you got Y, et cetera. And also they were competent. Yeah, yeah. So they were safe. You had some sense of safety with them. I think that was a big thing, though. I think it was a sense of psychological safety that wasn't there in the other school. And there were a couple of teachers, don't get me wrong, a couple of teachers from my other school I'll always remember and always be grateful to. For, you know, for encouraging me, making me feel like, you know, I could achieve stuff. Um, but it was a different, it was a totally different experience. I, t I did A-levels. I, I took psychology, sociology, religious studies again for some reason, probably because the only thing I was any, any thought I was any good at. Uh, medieval history, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff, general studies. So I did all these A-levels and right. I did all right, actually. I did all right. But I, general studies A-level, I remember uh, that. Understand. Yeah, I, I never. That, that was the easy one. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the only one I ever got an A in. Uh, <laughs> but, but I kind of went on and realized I've got a real interest in psychology. Here. I've got a real right. fascinated in psychology and sociology. Those, those were like really speaking to me. And I grew up in um, I grew up in an area where there's a close by where I lived was a guy that had what, what we would now describe as psychosis, and he was very unwell and behaved bizarrely a lot of people thought it was a bit scary and a bit they didn't really want a lot to do with him and I think he experienced quite a bit of stigma and you know felt isolated and my my the, the interesting thing about all that was I found that interesting and wanted to know what was going on with this guy and um my mum basically kind of looked out for him you know she yeah. looked out for him she took care of him really you know made sure he's okay made sure he had he was eating properly and he was changing his clothes and all of those things and, and, and just looked in on him most days. Um, and that was interesting. That was a formative experience because I realized then that people who were different, people who had mental health problems, people who had, who were a bit strange, a bit, you know, maybe behaved in a way that didn't make sense to me, that that wasn't something to be frightened of, actually. Yeah. What, what the correct response is, is to be compassionate and to try and help them. So that was it. That for me was the moment that I kind of realized that, well, I think probably going into something where it's about understanding people's behavior and, and, and emotional state is probably something I'm interested in. So when I got offered psychology at A-level, I was like, ah, these two things have suddenly come together. Um, so cut long story short, I ended up um, resitting a couple of my A-levels to get better grades. Um, I went to the University of Hull, did my undergraduate psychology degree. Um, and then spent the next three years doing different jobs in psychology, you know, assistant jobs. And yeah. my, my interest in trauma and adversity and, and serious mental health problems uh, started the day I walked into Presswich Hospital right. in Manchester. So I got a job as an assistant at Presswich and it was one of the, one of the last psychiatric institutions, one of the last asylums. And it was, I'd say, you know, three quarters closed down by that yeah. point. So at its heyday, there were 5,000 people in there. I know, that was huge. It, was, it had its own farm, its own power station, its own cricket pitch, football pitch. You know, it was 
You and I have a similar professional background in that we worked on these hospital closures. And yeah, and it, so I was part of the hospital closure, you know, and it was about obviously trying to get people, resettling people into the community who'd been there for 40, 50 years. Yeah. yeah. Which was, in principle, you know, it makes, I can see why that was an idea, but in reality, it didn't work out too well for a lot of those people. Yeah. Long story short, though, what I learned from that experience was containment is not a solution and institutionalization is not a solution that that's absolutely something that we must never go back to yeah. even though we're still doing it with prisons um but we're, before getting you know so i won't get off on a tangent about prisons but what i realized in that place was that the staff was just as institutionalized as the patients by the end um the system dominated it was there was no talk of people recovering or getting better. There was no talk of people being discharged in that setting. Yeah. There was just an assumption that's where they were going to be. Yeah. And they were all treated with these powerful drugs and there was no, not much psychological therapy. I think the, the kind of groups that I ran and the occasional visit from a couple of my supervisors was, was kind of the, the sum of the psychological input, but it wasn't a psychosocial or biopsychosocial response. It was containment and medication on, on the whole and ECT, uh, which is another barbaric sort of a practice that's got very questionable evidence. But um, so that was the minute. And I, the, I looked into the records of the people I was working with. I looked into their histories. And the only thing I could find in common was that they had bad things happen to them. That's the, that's the only thing those people had in common. They were all in the same hospital for some reason. But the only thing that seemed to stand out for me was that there was a, a, a preponderance or an excess of adversity in their lives. But let's, let's stick with that. I mean, I'm, there's, I mean, I'm going to tell you a story because I think it, it's very instructive in terms of um, what was going on in those institutions. I remember there was a, a patient, I didn't work with them, um, who, um, and this was a, a, a mostly learning disabilities hospital. But it was one of those bins, it was huge. And I had its farm, it had a crematorium. You were going to be born there, you were going to die there, and you were going to be cremated there. And um, But there was um, uh, a patient who used to walk around with a doll's head, a plastic doll's head, um, and, and normalisation theories had come in. And it's not appropriate for this adult to be walking around with this doll's head. Anyway, uh, there was a big debate on the ward about it. Anyway, I, just, I, I think it was an assistant psychologist decided to walk around the hospital grounds with this patient to try and figure out what was going on. And actually what she was doing was she was just talking to the doll and the doll's head and telling it off for all the bad things it had done. And she was describing literally all yeah. the sexual abuse that had happened to her. And that was the way she was co-regulating, was because nobody was sitting down listening to her and talking to her. And this was the first time that somebody just went in and said, because there was no therapy at all, there was no healing going on. Um, and, and, and the response was just to take this doll's head away from, well, you know, we won that one and we said, piss off and live yeah. with the doll's head until you give us something else. So. And that, those were the days when we were encouraged not to talk to people about their beliefs, their delu delusional beliefs. Yeah. And when you do get into talking to people about those delusional beliefs or those voices, or whatever, they usually relate to something bad that's happened. Exactly. And the Institute of Psychiatry, I think this, I did, um, I sponsored um, with the Guild of Health Writers. I spent it a trauma evening. I'm trying to remember the name of the young psychiatrist who came in, who has done some research of the Guild of Psychiatry, um, which was showing that 87% of people with psychosis, schizophrenia, um, have post-traumatic stress disorder because they had traumatic experiences. And that the core of their psychosis was not biological, it was psychological and social in origin, as in life experience, things that had happened to them. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, I, don't, I don't normally do this, Noel, but I don't, I don't often get the opportunity. Uh, but, um... Oh, wow. So I, I edited this in 2006. Is that by you? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Um, and that was ultimately a response to those experiences that we talked about, you know, that yeah. this belief that actually you can fix or repair, you know, psychological problems such as psychosis with medication or electricity, that, that, that actually we, we completely neglect the psychological experiences, the social experiences, the trauma that people have been through. And actually, when you get to the bottom of it, 
you know, we've known for years, you know, for 30 years from Rom and Esher's work that 70% of people start hearing voices after a traumatic event. You know, that was Rom and Esher's original work on voice yeah. hearing. Um, we now know that some of like 80 odd percent of people who um, have a diagnosis of psychosis report some form of childhood trauma. And that, you know, when we look at the meta-analysis, if we could prevent childhood adversity, we'd see at least a third less cases just, of first just episode of psychosis. There's a film I want to tell you about because I think you'll find it fascinating, and, and you know maybe people want to watch it as well. Um, it, I find it a highly disturbing and frightening film um, because it's so accurate. Um, let me just see if I can find it. Called, it's called Exposed, um, and you can get it on Prime, Amazon Prime, but you should probably find it elsewhere. And it's got Keanu Reeves, and it's a crime detective drama, but um, it's got the most accurate depiction I've seen, most evocative, sorry, depiction yeah. I've seen of somebody who has trauma and developed psychotic uh, experiences from it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a young woman in it that has this, and I'm not going to give the plot away, but it's well worth watching. There's a young woman who starts off, her psychotic experiences start off, she's on a uh, platform in the underground in the subway in New York, um, and she sees a guy, an uh, albino guy in a white suit, walk on air, and for her, it's Jesus Christ. I, actually, it turns out to be something very, very different. Uh, what what actually happened to her? Um, and, and, but it's a brilliant description of what happens, how the mind splits in the face of uh, trauma it can't process. I think, yeah, that sounds like something I definitely need to watch. Actually, um, I, I would watch it. You know, I'm not yeah, going to yeah. give the the no, game. I, away. I think, I, I think I, those kind of depictions are important because I think. For the majority of people that experience psychosis, there's usually something traumatic in their lives yeah. or something adverse. And that's really important because if we don't ask people what's happened to them, yeah. we the response will generally be, and we're much better off now. We've got first episode psychosis services that are biopsychosocial. There's psychological therapies in those teams. There's social support in those teams. There's help getting work and community engagement and activity and education. So the very, you know, the response of people now having a first episode of psychosis is, you know, transformed and evidence-based and really effective most of the time. So most people can expect to recover from an experience of psychosis. And that's where we've got to. And that's probably why, you know, I've spent most of my, my kind of clinical career working in mental health and psychosis in particular, because my, it was my belief from the minute I walked into Presswich and started opening the files that, this is not about dodgy brain chemistry or faulty neurons or, or inherited genes. For a lot of people, this is about bad stuff that's happened that's not been dealt with. You know, they're and, in pain. And even if there is an inherited component, it's often the inheritances of the trauma anyway, because we know that trauma is passed on down the amygdala, the amygdala, so from uh, mother to in utero. And so there have been various studies that have shown. There's epigenetic that. studies that. that Absolutely, without about, a doubt. Yeah. And I mean, I think it really. You know, we're beginning to understand the impact of environment and trauma on, mm -hmm. and, and trauma has an impact on uh, genetic coding and all, all sorts of stuff. So um, you're with me. You don't need to sell that to me. I want to come back a little bit and circle us back to the Resilience Task Force. Mm. Um, and I, 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 I was, because I, I'd done the research call with you, I knew this backstory. I just sort of wanted people to hear it because I think it's really important that um, people get it, that, you know, the vast majority of us are healers because we, we, we had ex life experience, right? Whatever we look like now, stuff happened to us that we had to process and understand. And I'm really interested in this early experience you had of those two different schools because it seems to me that was in some way formative experience around your um, experience of adversity and the opposite of adversity. So you have one school that's adverse, yeah. the other school that's an asset. Uh, and it... Uh, it turned your life around uh, and, and so it, yeah I think it know. did I think it yeah. did I mean I've had uh, I kind of you know not going into details I have experienced a, a number of traumas in my life um yeah and I and you know I'm on my fourth therapist I think it is yeah um, the other three are in a special home for one out therapists <laughs> um, they're all they're all trying to support each other <laughs> after what they've been through with me um, but I, I'm still, I'm still work in progress. You know, I'm still, I'm definitely still work in progress. And, um, I, I do think that the turning point, you know, as you say, the turning point for me was 
go into a different environment and go into to a place where I felt safe, psychologically safe, emotionally safe, where people, where I got, you know, ultimately what I've been saying to teachers recently is, you know, when you've got kids coming back to school, forget, for the time being, forget academic that's Forget the curriculum, that's it. That's, that's what, exactly what they right. need to, Yeah, they need to feel. Both on attachment, safety, safety. warm relationship. Yeah. Warm. That's and it. that was the key for me. You know, I felt safe yeah. in that school. Yeah. I felt a connection with people. I felt part of something. And I was encouraged. There was an expectation that I'd do well. Yeah. Uh, and that transformed things for me. You know, and the thing, the fundamental fact is if you're under huge amounts of stress, you can't learn. It's impossible. You know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-actualization, where you can learn and take on new information and develop and problem solve and use this, you know, your, this front part of your brain that's the sophisticated bit, that's impossible if you're constantly looking around to see what's happening. You know? It's interesting that the, the hmm. frontal lobes are only sophisticated because we're social animals, which is bizarre. That they, it, all this, it's because it wasn't doing anything. And yeah. it became useful because we hung out in groups. Yeah. Um, and we had these relationships with each other. Yeah, yeah completely. And I think that's, that's the other thing, you know, when you feel safe in, in the collective, when you feel safe in the part of that school community, you feel like you belong, that you're, that you're safe in that context. Suddenly, your capacity for learning is enhanced because when you're constantly looking out for signs of danger, yeah. your cognitive capacity is focused on looking for signs of threat. <clears throat> what you're not it's also, doing it's also i mean the, the stuff that we value from education like um literature or the arts or history or knowledge and that's a byproduct of the fact that our frontal lobes are working well and they're only working well when we're in safe um warm loving relationships with each other and um, which is fundamentally i suppose a message about the resilience task force yeah that that what, what happened, I think, during the pandemic, what is still going on, um, is that we were sent signals that things are not safe at all. Yeah. And not only, you know, not safe in not in the obvious way. I mean, it's obvious that the virus is not safe. That's an obvious message that was that was sent, stay home. But we were, we were sent signals it's not safe in a way that are not conscious and not cognitive, which is we were disconnected from everything that gave us stability in life. Yeah, everything that gives us stability, our home life, our work life, our friends, da, 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 da. Yeah. every single one of those is impacted upon. So without a doubt that this is adverse in every sense of the word uh, and that without a doubt, we need to really think about that. And that's why I'm very excited by the idea of mm. this resilience task force, which then can, I guess, look at those issues, but crucially know how to uh, make us feel safe again. Because I think a lot of the stuff that's going on around um, BLM is, is happening within a context. And it's happening in a context where um, the, the signals that we are safe have been taken away. Uh, yeah. And that's partly why it's, sort of taken fire in the way it does. It should take fire. I don't, I'm don't. i not criticising. I don't think there's something wrong going on. But yeah. it, it sort of makes sense within that context that, um, that it was a, you know, a, a, um, a, a match, a spark to the fact that we were all quite afraid, really. Mm. Right? Mm. You know? Yeah, I, I think I agree. I think it's, there's two, you know, there's two kind of uh, aspects to this for me. One is that people who weren't having emotional distress before yeah. are no and yeah. that's understandable and that's the other thing to say is you know let's not pathologize people who are feeling scared and anxious and a bit low in mood because that's pretty much all of us <laughs> you know so let's not let's not kind of look at people around us and kids that come back to school and go there must be something wrong with them because they're feeling frightened and they're insecure well yeah that's isn't that understandable given what's going on However, you're going to have a whole other group of people who have already been struggling. And this, this, as you've just highlighted, this situation's removed all the buffering factors that help them cope with stress. Yeah. All of those sources of resilience, all of those sources of safety, those human connections that make them feel safe, those escape routes, you know, physical spaces where they can get away from certain toxic situations. Um, and as you said, the messaging as well is very fear-inducing 
for people. Yeah. And then I think I think the other factor is, you know, this existential insecurity. You know, people are now worried about their livelihood. People are worried about whether they're going to be able to pay the bills. And that's that for, that, for me, that is huge. You know, on top of the physical threat, you've also got an existential threat, which is can I look after my family and can I pay the bills? That, that is huge, you know, and the reason we said, you know, we wanted to call for this resilience task force is there are social and psychological consequences, some which could be predicted, as we said at the beginning, some which couldn't. Nonetheless, there are significant consequences that are affecting the way huge parts of society are coping. And when we stop coping, we use more resources, more services. And when we use more services and there's a recession, that's a problem because resources go down, demand goes up. And we just see it unraveling across society. So we're saying, look, let's start planning for this now. Let's get a cross-sector group together. Let's come up with a national response plan. Uh, we're not saying we can fix it all straight away, but there are some things that we can do where we can make support available. We can help people feel connected. We can make sure people get the right help. We don't give people you know, help that don't need it. We, we watch and wait. We keep a sensible um, observation of children and, and people that we're working with. We don't pathologize them. Yeah. But at the same time, if they do need that extra help, we make sure they get it. And we look after the staff and we make sure that families are not, you're not, you know, don't descend into, into poverty and, and, you know, loss and that they're worried to a point where they can't cope um, because they're, they're stressed about paying the bills and putting food on the table. So there's a lot we can do, but in order to do it, I think we need to get all these different agencies across the sectors together to talk about what it looks like from their perspective because funding one you know giving 76 million pounds to domestic violence from domestic abuse services is a good thing but it's not going to solve this wider complexity this wider psychosocial impact it, it's not cohesive is it it's not a, an integrated response it's a, a siloed reaction and, and, and it is that will help but it won't solve the problem so and essentially, I guess what you're saying, and which you know, is a message I would echo and support, is that we have to think about those connections between. Yeah, absolutely. And, and reconnecting, uh, and really bring. We also, I mean, I think we we have an opportunity here for something quite transformative in terms of mm. the current social contract, um, and, yeah. and looking at that as a, uh, and, and many people are talking about that now. That that the sort of this is a possibly a transformative moment in, in our story in the UK, possibly globally, um, in, in revisioning or re reimagining the social contract and what that might look like. And, um, and we've seen, I think, um, some moves towards that in terms of, you know, this government thinking very differently about um, sort of economic policy and, and in, in a way that um, this style of government or this political party, I've never heard them talk about things in this way before and I don't want to get into political debates about it but it's very different um, and the idea of uh, them putting in Keynesian type economics is I just find very odd um, uh, um, because I'm not used to that from that that particular party but it makes sense you know it makes absolute sense that you 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 bounce the economy back as much as possible and you make sure people have money in their pockets um, because it makes sense economically, but it also makes sense in terms of dealing with this sense of threat, yeah, and lessening the sense of threat for people. I think if we let families descend into poverty, you know, it's quite predictable. Children are more vulnerable. You know, yeah. parents are not able to get, meet their basic needs when they're stressed about money and safety and survival, and you're putting food on the table. You know that's a bad thing for families. So definitely we should, we should put economic supports in place, but you know, I know we're kind of coming towards the end, but I would say this is a moment in time. This is a really important moment in time, which is the other reason why we wanted to call on the government to, to, you know, tackle some of these issues or at least start to think about them Yeah. Uh, because it's probably, it's the first time I've experienced this kind of thing in my lifetime, but it's probably not going to be the last. And I think, it's really important to take that step back and say, what have the consequences been? And what have we learned from it? Yeah. And can we do better next time? And the answer to all those things is yes, absolutely. Of course we can learn from it and do better. Yeah. But only if, we, only if we acknowledge there's an issue. So if we go back to business as usual and pretend that we can just because the, the R numbers dropped, that we can just pick up our tools and get back to work and pretend nothing's happened. 
that would be a mistake. It that would be a huge I, mistake. I don't believe it's going to happen. I mean, I think there is a movement towards uh, uh, quite a, a reimagining, reimagining of that sort of such contract. We are at I the end. So. I hope so. We are at the end, unfortunately, Warren, uh, which okay. is unfortunate because in a sense, we're just beginning the conversation, but, um, you know, both of us need to get to bed. We're old men. We can't cope I'll with... speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm an old man. I need to get to bed. Um, and, like that, yeah. But it's, it's just been absolutely amazing to have you on. Um, you. And what I'd like to think about is that maybe in uh, not too distant future, but in, in, in we come back and we talk again. Uh, That'd be about great, yeah. We are and, and have have these ideas caught on uh is it is it um in the meantime i'd encourage people to go and check out um uh, uh, the work that warren's doing what's your website again tell me warren well i've got my my day job website is uh warren larkin associates.co.uk and my the resilience task force uh, website is resilience task force.co.uk okay and we'll put those in the um, video as we send it out it should go up on facebook live now um, this afternoon. Brilliant. brilliant to have you on gonna say goodbye folks Thanks, no. and we shall see you um, next week and i do know who's on but i have to open my emails and tell you because my memory is dreadful keep it suspenseful yeah i'm gonna keep it you in suspense i won't tell you who's on it's a brilliant guest um it's been fantastic to have you um tonight folks um and gonna say goodbye for now thanks very much thanks no Bye, everyone.